going? <laughs> good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, let's let's wait a couple of seconds here before we get started to just confirm that we're live. Mm -hmm. I think. All right. Yeah, I think we are good to go. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex. This is another edition of Creative Coding with Code Academy. I'm here again with Jiwon. Jiwon, how's it going? Good. Uh, everything's going well. This is already um, session seven, which is actually um, amazing that we've made it all the way this far. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got one more. Uh, next week is going to be our last session. But for today's session, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be looking at a machine learning algorithm visualized using P5. So again, uh, I, I led the session last week, which was very much focused on like, let's learn this core, let's learn about object-oriented programming through the lens of P5. Similarly, this lesson is going to be, let's learn about the k-nearest neighbor algorithm through P5. And so again, Jiwon, you're really the P5 expert. I think that as we're doing this, uh, I'm sure you will have lots of input onto different ways that I could make this prettier and more artistic. Um, but for the most part, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be seeing my very unartistic brain uh, just coding up this algorithm and, and explaining the algorithm. Um, as always, we've got the chat open on YouTube. So if you want to talk with us there or ask questions there, um, very happy to chat with you there. And then uh, anything else for, from you, G1, before we get started? No, I'm excited. Cool. Let's do it. So I'm going to share my screen here. All right. Um, first thing that I want to say is before we get started, um, I've linked in the YouTube description uh, a link to our K Nearest Neighbor course. Um, so if you want to dive deeper into this and go through the whole course, um, that's available to you. And then the other thing that I've linked is the solution code, which I'm going to walk through here. So before we get started coding this thing, let's actually talk about what this algorithm is doing. And so this is a supervised machine learning algorithm, which essentially means that we are uh, given some data, which in this case is going to be these dots on the screen. We're going to try to predict something about a new piece of data. Let me actually randomize my points to get more, okay, more even split. So uh, the k-nearest neighbor algorithm, first I'm going to talk about it just as these dots and colors, and then we can talk about OK, what does this actually mean for a real application? Because who cares about dots and colors? But for now, let's just look at the dots and colors. So right now, what the k-nearest neighbor algorithm does is it says, OK, we have all of this existing data. We have dark blue and light green data that each have an x and y position. And so we can draw them on a, on a map. And now if I come in with a new piece of data, if I have something, if I have a new dot that doesn't have a color but it has an x or y position, the thing that we want to do is assign it a color. And the way that we do that is by looking at its nearest neighbors. So if I start to mouse over the, um, the canvas here, you'll see that it kind of looks like I'm painting um, different colors. And so what's happening here is that each time I move my mouse, I'm saying, OK, I have a new piece of data that I don't know the answer to. I don't know if you're green or blue. And so what we're doing right now, and you can even see uh, the, three, the three dots highlighted in yellow, those are my three nearest neighbors. And since they are all uh, light green, I'm going to say, OK, if I had an uh, unknown point where my mouse is, that's also going to be green. If I move up here, now where my mouse is, again, that unknown point, two of those neighbors are blue, and one of them is green. And so we're going to say, OK, we're going to classify that unknown point as dark blue. So that's, that's really the, the essence of the algorithm, is we have known points. We have points where the class is known. And this is why it's a supervised machine learning algorithm. We, we have a data set where we know things about it already. And we're, we're saying we're going to use that information to try to classify unknown points. And it's kind of mm. cool. You can see we can, uh, we can kind of paint the decision space here. We can see, OK, where, where would things be classified as green versus where would things be classified as blue? Interesting. So it's not just about the distance of the, the new data point between, um, between the existing points. It's also about how many of those near points are for one category versus another. Yeah, exactly. And that's actually where the K in k nearest neighbor 
um, comes from. Right now, k is three. And so you could think of that as, okay, I'm looking at my three nearest neighbors. So again, when my mouse, mm -hmm. let me re-randomize it, clear it off. When my mouse is right here, my three ne nearest neighbors are, uh, you know, uh, those three, three points that are highlighted in yellow. But if I move down here, it's three different points. I can also then change k and see, okay, if k is seven, the decision space is going to look different, right? Uh, things mm -hmm. are going to be classified differently because um, we're looking at a wider section of the original data. So what, what would be some of the use cases, like real life use, use cases where you would apply this algorithm to then? Yeah, so, so right. So this is um, uh, points floating in space with colors. The thing that we're trying to classify as a color. The example that I always like to use is um, classifying like movie ratings. Um, mm. And so you could think of something like uh, light green is a thumbs up and dark blue is a thumbs down. So let's say you've seen 20 movies or however many dots there are here. I, yeah, I believe there's 20. You've seen 20 movies already. You've given some of them a thumbs up and some of them a thumbs down. And now you can use that existing data to say, okay, this movie that I haven't seen, uh, am I gonna like it or not? And I'm gonna figure that out by, look, by taking a look at the movies that I have seen and seeing which movie, you know, how similar my unseen movie is to the movies that I have seen. So thinking about that, you, you, you might say, okay, then what are my two dimensions, right? I have, uh, all of these points have two dimensions. They have an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. You could say the X coordinate of the, of the point is maybe um, the year it was released and the Y coordinate of the point is how many minutes long it is. And so you can plot out all your movies where Okay, something that's way over on the right, if I said X was when it was released, maybe that's released in 2020. And if it's way over on the left, that's re released in 1920 or whenever the first movies were. And then uh, the Y dimension, if that's movie length, something near the bottom might be a really short 60 minute movie, something near the top might be a long four hour movie. And so you can start to say, okay, let me take all the movies that I've seen and rated, put them into this graph, uh, you know, plot them like this, and now any movie that I haven't seen, I can find it's the year it came out and I can find how long it is. And then I can say, okay, if my point were there, would you be light green or would you be dark blue? So it's a, it's a way to classify things that, um, mm. classify movies that you haven't seen before based on the movies that you've already seen. Cool, interesting. Um, another really common, uh, or really an example that's kind of easy to wrap your mind around is looking for apartments. So you can think of the features of your apartments could be, okay, uh, um, price and square footage, and then again, <laughs> the thing that you're the thing that you're determining is whether or not I might be interested in buying that. And so, you go and see twenty apartments. You get your data set. You say, oh, I uh, I was interested in these. I wasn't interested in these. And then you can use that existing data set to then say, okay, this apartment that I haven't seen, do I think I'm going to like it or not based on those those apartments I did see. It could also be interesting to do to have like a plotted um, points of, you know, like price could be on the x-axis and square footage could be on the y-axis and the color could be coordinated into Manhattan versus Brooklyn. And you could make a guess um, if, <laughs> if the point was on there, is it more likely to be a Brooklyn apartment or a Manhattan apartment? That could be interesting thing to figure out. Totally. And, and I, I guess like a couple of things to talk about before we get into this is right now, in all of these examples, we've dealt with two features um, looking to classify one thing. So, right, movie release year and length, uh, trying to classify whether or not we like it. The thing is that you can expand that to three dimensions. So you mm -hmm. can imagine plotting these points in three-dimensional space and then finding the distance between them. Um, so that would be like, you know, release year, um, price, or uh, release year length, and- Production like, budget. Yeah, budget, exactly. You can even do Booleans, like is you know Tom Cruise in this movie or something. <laughs> right? that, could, that could be a feature. Um, so you can do that in three dimensions. And then the really crazy thing is um, you can do that in N dimensions. So you can do it in four dimensions, five dimensions. And obviously that becomes really difficult to visualize, but it's the same principle of, I have this unknown point that's floating in you know 10 dimensional space let me compare, let me find its nearest neighbors in 10 dimensional space and see what class they are. They are. So you can, uh, you know, you can add more and more features um, if you have those features to play around with. 
Interesting. So you can get it more and more complex, as, as complex as you want it to be. Yeah, exactly. And there's lots of, I mean, this, this then starts to really get into machine learning um, and like good machine learning principles of which features do you use, which one shouldn't you be using. Um, uh, an interesting example that you gave of like budget is you have to think about the scale of your features. So mm -hmm. for example, if, um, if one feature is in the scale of the millions and the other feature is in the scale of the tens, then that feature that's in the scale of the millions is just going to totally dominate in terms of distance, right? Because like, you know, these two points might be a million units apart in this dimension and one unit apart in that other dimension. And so, you know, your mm. distance calculation gets, gets a little bit hazy there. So there might be things that you want to do to normalize your features. Um, so tons of ways that you can dive even deeper into it. But yeah, that's the, that's the main um, concept is that we have points in space and we're going to find the k closest points in space and uh, and look at the, the class of those points cool 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 okay um folks in chat if you have any questions about the algorithm itself happy to answer it but for now let me let's go ahead and try to code this up um cool let me also pull this to the side just so i can have my solution code up in case i screw something up um cool so let me get my chat window. All right. Um, okay, cool. So I think the best way to start uh, this project is to, um, first of all, make it object-oriented. So uh, our last session is very relevant to this. Let's define what a point is. And so let me go ahead and do that. Jiwon, what are the features of these points, do you think? First, I guess there, like you said, there needs to be some sort of an X and Y position, right? Mm -hmm. So then we're gonna need a um, a attribute for X and Y. Yeah, and we can. I, I guess that's that's something that we haven't talked about, which is to um, provide arguments as constructor. I, I can't remember if we did that or not, but that's something worth mentioning that we can talk about later. Sure. Um, yeah. And in, in fact, we we what we're gonna do for our. Uh for our version here is we're just gonna like randomize the X and mm -hmm. Y points. So we almost don't even need attributes. We could just make them random right here. Um, but yeah, actually let, let's do that. So we're, we're gonna need X and Y. And then one other thing, what, el what else do these points all have? Color. Yeah, color. Right. So that is the class of the point, right? So um, yeah, that, that's the class and Eventually, that class is going to be represented as a color, but internally, let's just represent that class as a one or a zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, cool. Let's do a little bit of setup here of just giving it random x and y uh, values. And let me find. So, if I do, what was the p5 function for getting something random, Juan? It was like random. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So when we create a point, we're going to give it a random x value uh, between 0 and the width of the canvas, and uh, same thing for the height. And then for the class, what we want is we want just one of two numbers, right? We want it to either be a 1 or a 2. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the way that I did this when I was coding this up, but Jiwon, I bet you have a better way to do it. So I did math.random. Which uh, you can replace by random. Yep. So yeah, let me just do random. <laughs> so that's a that's a random number between zero and one, right. excluding one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if I do random two, that's between zero and two, x mm -hmm. two. And these are all decimals, right? Mm -hmm. So now if I floor that, I believe this will give me either zero or one. Right. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what we'll get. Is there a better way in P5 to just say I want a random number between zero and one, or either zero or one? Um, I think that's that's exactly how I would do it, to be honest. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. So again, if you uh, uh, this random number is going to be a random decimal between zero and two, so that might be point zero seven five, and then floor is just cut off the, the decimal, basically round down. So if I get 0 0.05, that's going to become a zero. If I get 
1.99999, that's going to become a one. So mm -hmm. the only thing this is ever going to be is a zero or a one. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Uh, let's also quickly write something to draw the points. So I'm going to call this uh, just, uh, yeah, display, I guess. Um, I'm going to draw an ellipse at this dot x, uh, this dot y. Going to make it uh, 20 by 20. I think I only need one parameter there. But and so that'll draw, draw an ellipse. We can even run this. And of course, it uh, doesn't run anything yet because we haven't actually created points. Um, let's mm -hmm. go ahead and do that. So in setup, we can say, all right, let me create. I'm going to create this as a global variable. Again, something that's like maybe not great. Uh, you um, want to use let instead of bar. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to assign points to be an empty array. Um, let's also have num points. Let's just code that in as a variable so I can not hard code that everywhere. And now I'm going to uh, add 20 points to this array. So for um, Uh, so I'm going to do 20, this for loops running 20 times. Um, what am I going to do? I need to push a new point into points. So points.push new point. Cool. And then, so that's creating the points. And in terms of drawing the points, I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to have a loop. And instead of pushing a point to points, I'm going to grab the point from my array and tell it to draw itself, which I called display. All right. Let's see. Ooh. Excellent. There are my points. So we haven't done anything with the color yet. So that would be something that is responsible in uh, display. So let's say um, if this dot class Oops, sorry. If it's a zero, for now, let's just do fill red uh, 255, zero, zero. And then in JavaScript, is it else, else. or else? No, just else. Or unless, yeah. are you going to do one or the other? Or are you going to also um, check if the class is something else? I mean, I guess we could do else because we know it's either going to be zero or one. I was going to do an else if just to. Just that way, if somehow it we screwed it up and it wasn't zero or one, that it would be. Uh, I guess yeah. It really help. It you could do else if. Yeah. Let me let me do else if. So else if this dot class is one, then let me do red. This one will be green. Also, one more note: um, in JavaScript, you want to make sure that they are, you know, equal regardless of type. So you want to do three equals. Cool. Yeah, so again, this is my kind of lack of JavaScript knowledge. <laughs> so is that like if if this dot class were a float and this is an int, then those wouldn't actually be equal? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so we've got our points. They're being randomly generated each time we run this. Uh, they are being redrawn, um, which is great. So now we can actually dive into writing the k-nearest neighbor algorithm. So what do we want to do? We want to say, wherever my mouse point pointer is, I want to find the k nearest points. And so to do that, we're going to need to have some measure of distance. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you could measure distance. Um, the most kind of common one is just the straight line distance. So that's using some you know, Pythagorean theorem stuff, uh, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Um, there are other distance metrics that you could use. One is called um, Manhattan distance. So rather than looking at like the diagonal from my mouse to this point, it says, how far over are you and how far up are you? So it's kind of taking the two other sides of the triangle rather than the diagonal of the triangle. Um, it's called Manhattan distance because it's um, like street blocks where I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm 10 points over and 15 points up. Um, Interesting. And so, and so I'm 25 points over. 
So again, this is kind of something that we go, go through in the class itself, but there are different reasons why you might want to use different district, district distance metrics. But for this, let's just say we are going to use um, the straight line point between the, between the two points. Um, cool. So we want to do that. And then really what we want to do is we want to compare our distance to every point that exists. Um, because we don't know which, which point is going to be the closest, right? Visually, you and I can say, okay, my mouse is here. The closest three points are like that one, that one, and that one. But the computer can't just like look at it and see that. So what the computer has to do is it has to look at every single point and say, which are the three that I'm closest to. So let's start trying to write that up. Um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make it a separate function called classify mouse. And um, yeah, we can give it no parameter for now. Um, so again, just saying, maybe we should give it a parameter. Uh, so we, <laughs> let's give it a parameter of k. So given k, where again, that's the number of neighbors, how is my mouse going to be classified? So right, uh, Jiwon, where my mouse is right now, um, if k were, actually, let me go here. <laughs> my, uh, it's still even going to be hard. Uh, OK, if my mouse were here and k were 3, what would my what would the classification be? I think it would be green, because yeah, there's right. a green one on the left corner there, and then the green one on the bottom right corner there, and there's one red one. But because there's two green ones, it would also be green. Yeah, totally. Um, and then if, if k were 4, the fourth closest point is probably that one. And so we have a tie. We'll have to think about what we do in ties. If it were five, mm. looks like it would be green again. It would be three versus two. If it's if it were six, it's back to a tie. This one might start getting in the mix. Uh, that one might not be closer or not. But so that's kind of what we, what we have to think about, where given K, our classification might change from, from green to red. So we're going to need to know how many neighbors we actually care about. OK. Cool. Cool. So like I said, we want to look at every point and find the distance to that point. So let's do that by just creating a list. So let distances, it's an empty list. Uh, I'm going to grab my for loop for all of my points. All right. So what do we want to do in this for loop? We want to say, I want to add to distances the distance between my mouse and the point itself. So G1, I had, in my solution code, I had written up a big nasty function to like <laughs> doing the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You said, hey, there's a, a, a p5 function that does exactly that for you. Um, so we don't have to do that ourselves. So do you know what that function is? Yeah, there's a function in e 5 called dist. So like short for distance. And you give it um, a, se a set of four arguments, first two for the first endpoint, and then the other two for the second endpoint. And um, yeah, it's generally in P5.js, it's used to measure the distance between your mouse and an existing element, a shape element in, uh, in Canvas. So you can, um, most common use of that would be like to detect whether the mouse is on an element or not. So we can, I think we can use that um, this function instead of doing the, it does behind the scenes exactly what you're saying, the measuring the Pythagorean uh, distance between the two points, the straight distance to, to between the two points. But I think we can save everyone from the actual <laughs> mathematics of it and just use the function. Yeah, for sure. Um, OK, cool. So I, I actually changed my, the name of my array to distances because we're going to be storing multiple distances in there. And let me first just save this as a variable as distance equals um, OK, so calling the dist function, I need to give it four values now. I can mm -hmm. give it my mouse x, uh, my mouse y, and now the x position and the y position of the point that I'm looking at. So the point that I'm looking at is, what did I call this? Points are stored, oops, uh, points are stored in the array called points. Points of i is the point that I'm looking at. And then I want that points x value, and then that points y value. Um, cool. 
And then that's the distance. And so let me just push that onto distances. So distances.push. Um, did I screw something up? Why is that not blue? Mm, I think it's just because it's a um, local variable. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Okay. But you might want to um, put a let before distance, even though you know JavaScript is fluid and that will work. But mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Cool. And so now actually what I'm going to do just to see if this is going to work, I'm going to console.log distances. And then I need to call this function somewhere. So I'm going to say, OK, in the draw loop, after I've drawn all my points, let me call classify mouse with uh, some parameter of k. I'll say for right now, k is 3, even though we're not doing anything with that yet. Mm -hmm. And so we should see a bunch of things continue to point out. Um, so let me actually stop this before my computer overheats. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so what that was doing was every, every frame of the P5 loop, which again is happening 60 frames per second, um, it's looking at where my mouse is and then it's comparing it to every other point. So this is what our array looks like. My mouse was 216. Um, units I pixels. Guess, away from, yeah pixels away from uh one of the points 247 away from another one of the points so and there's all 20 points so cool um in theory now we could say uh let's or let's sort this list from lowest to highest and then just grab our k closest points mm. um jiwan do you see an issue with that what are we missing if we just say let me sort these uh, these distances and grab the three lowest ones. How are we going to tell which um, index that would be, the top three would be, if that makes sense? Because right now we yeah. have it per index, right? And if we shuffle them um, in the order that we want, we're going to lose the order. Yeah, exactly. So if we were to sort this, great. It's, it's awesome that there's a point 56 pixels away. But as soon as I start reordering this list, I'm going to lose which pixel or which point that was connected with. And the whole point of doing this is we need to see, OK, what, it, what were the classes of those points, right? We need to say, say were you red or green in order to, to make our, um, um, in order to classify our, our unknown points. So Jiwon, what would you do to fix that? How would you, because uh, I think there are a couple of different things that you can do here. Um, how would you kind of keep track of what distance is connected to which point? Um, I think there could be a number of things. Um, I don't know if my answer is going to complicate things, but you could. We could create a what's called a um, you know two D array, so to speak, and so that we could sort based on one number in that one array. So that so okay, okay, backtracking a little bit, we could have one mega array, and in it, individual um, elements could be another array that is a pair of index number and the value itself. And then we could sort it based on the value itself. And then so then you, you reorder the arrays inside of the bigger array rather than uh, moving around the H, just the value itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. So instead of pushing on just the distance, what we're gonna do is we're gonna push on an array of distance and then let's say I, just the, the index of that distance was at. So now if I run this code, Oh, we have and, a, oh, we are calling it. Okay. And we look, again, I stopped it just because it to keep it running <laughs> forever. We look at one of these now. We can say, okay, the, yeah, uh, 318 was connected to um, uh, the point at index zero. Uh, 190 was connected to the point at index one. And so now if we shuffle up this, uh, if we shuffle up, up this list, if we sort by this first number, we will hopefully uh, be able to reference back, OK, you were connected to point number one, or you were connected to point number zero. Cool. This is like maybe one of the trickier parts of, of doing this, is now we have to write kind of our own custom sorting function. And I'm actually curious to see what happens if I just tell it to sort. So if I do uh, distances.sort. Let's see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't think 
Is it gonna work? I don't it think it's gonna work. work. Yeah. So let's see. Ooh. Oh. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's sorting. I always run into this in, in JavaScript when I'm trying to sort. And honestly, I don't know uh, how to get around it. I believe it's sorted as if this were a string. So the ones came first, then the twos. And if I scroll mm. all the way to the bottom, uh, you know, the eights and nines are towards the bottom. Um, so yeah. that, that didn't quite work. Yeah, so it uh, says it's comparing, I'm looking quickly looking up the MDN docs, but it's comparing their sequences to the UTF-16 code units value. So yeah, it's checking it as like a string value as if the, this was um, that the, the number that we have is a string. So basically the ones come first and then the twos will come and then the threes will come. It doesn't matter if it's 200 or two. Yeah. Exactly. And so I, I got to feel like there's a better way to sort a list of numbers in JavaScript, but I don't know it. Um, and so what I did is I wrote my own custom sort function. So the way that that looks is you can pass, and, and again, I think I'm probably going to like have the terminology wrong here. Um, as a parameter, I can pass a function mm -hmm. that takes two values. And so it's saying, OK, if I'm sorting thing A and thing B, if A of, uh, if the, so thing A and thing B are one of these subarrays of distance and I. So A of 0 is the first thing that we're comparing, its distance. If A's uh, distance is greater than B's distance, um, then I'm going to return one, meaning A was greater. And then otherwise, I'm going to return zero. Uh, sorry, return negative one, meaning B was greater. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I do this, now let's see if this works. Mm -hmm. Seems yeah. good so far. Yeah. yeah. I do have to say, I would probably have done exactly the same thing as you did, Alex, in JavaScript, just because um, so sort is an array method, right? And we are able to use this sort method because distances is a, an array. And there are a number of um, JavaScript functions that you can use that is specific to method called method, um, array methods, because array in JavaScript is also kind of considered as an um, JavaScript built-in object. And that uh, we're, when we create arrays, it kind of is a, a the same way as looking at it as if we're creating an instance of the array object. And so in this way, there are a number of um, different methods that we can use that you can only use for um, array objects. And in JavaScript, that can be a little bit confusing because JavaScript is not supposed to have a data type. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. But the sort fun uh, method can take in what's called a function expression as an argument of the sort method, which is what Alex has done in there. And if we take a look at the MDN um, documentation, which I will post very soon into the chat, this is basically what they recommend you do yeah. in the MDN uh, documentation that if you want to sort between two numbers and basically what happens in here is that even though I was here returning um, a one or a minus one, depending on whether one is greater than the other, what that will do is that the sort method will do it, apply for all the other things and it will um, go in like a loop. So sort function um, behind the scenes will be running a loop and do all of these comparison between all the numbers in the E um, or, or the elements, I, I guess, all the elements inside of the distances um, array. And this particular one, because you want to compare, you know, whether one, one numeric value is greater than the other numeric value that we're referencing because um, our distance is, uh, array is a nested um, array in an array in an array. You have to specify which element in that one element, array element, you want it to compare it um, to. And then it will do it for the whole loop and then order it. So in yeah. a way, you can think that th this is actually quite a short, a short way of doing it, really. <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, to be clear, if I if I reverse the order here, if I put the index first and then the distance second, uh, I would then say, okay, the thing that I want to sort based off of whenever I'm comparing two things in the distances list, 
I don't care about, I don't want to sort by I, right? I want to sort by uh, the distance, which now because I've reversed it is A of one and B of one. And so if I run this again, you should hopefully see um, same thing. Yeah, wow, mm -hmm. my, my mouse was like right on top of some, uh, five pixels away. Um, there's some impl uh, implications of ties, right? So if, if my mouse is exactly the same distance away from two points, um, it's going to return. So if, if A of one and B of one are equal, it's going to return negative one, meaning B was actually greater. So again, it's, I guess it's not really, it'd be really hard to even demonstrate this, but I suppose be aware that if two, if two points are exactly the same distance away from, uh, uh, from your mouse, you have to choose one to be closer than the other, right? You can't say both are equally close. I, I suppose you could, but then things would get very complicated. Um, and so it basically kind of ran, it kind of arbitrarily picks B to be the one that's closer. Um, but it is going to be one. really hard to demonstrate because as you can see in the, um, the first element of the <laughs> yeah. arrays, they go up to, I don't know how many number of the de um, decimal points that is, but um, you will have to be really, really accurate. And that's not something that, I guess we don't have to worry too much about because we're demonstrating this in P5, but it could potentially be a little bit of like a edge case scenario because if you have like, you know, like very specific scientific points between one or the other. And if there is a chance where this two could be, you know, exactly the same, then it would arbitrarily choose B over A. Yeah, same thing with uh, whatever distance function you cho chose to use could affect this where, um, again, the thing that we're using is just the straight line distance, um, which results in these decimals. But if you did something like Manhattan distance, which is how many pixels over and how many pixels up are you away from uh, from the point, then we're not really going to have these decimals. So still pretty unlikely that you would have that you'd be exactly the same distance away from two points, but I guess slightly more likely than uh, than using um, straight line distance. Cool. Um, where are we? So we've got our point of, let me just, okay. We've got our sorted list of distances. And furthermore, we have the uh, index associated with those closest points. So now what we want to do is we want to say, let's grab those K closest points and see if, though, if red or green wins, right? Are there more red, close red points or more close green points? Mm -hmm. So let's do another for loop. So let me even um, grab my for loop because I'm lazy. <laughs> um, let me also set a global variable for k. Uh, no, we don't even want a global variable for k. We're using just so three. Input. Yeah. Uh, so I want this loop to happen three times. And what I want to do is I want to Let's set up two counter variables. So class one, um, probably uh, other clever ways to, to compare these two things. Um, but I can say, OK, let me now go through my sorted array. So I want distances of i. And I already used i. So let me, I don't know if that matters or not, but let me use j here. It shouldn't matter, but yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so let me go through my sorted array. Let me grab the k closest point. So this point, I want to look at its class. So that was the point's class. And now I want to say, if its class was 0, uh, and there's my Python trying to use colons. <laughs> Uh, if it's class with zero, zero let's do class, uh, I'll name these zero and one, mm -hmm. class zero, uh, does plus plus exist in JavaScript? Or? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it does. And then if it was one, then uh, class one. But Alex, I'm thinking this might create an error, though. 
because the distances um, array is now in each of the elements is an array, right? So if we refer to all of that, what we're saying is that we're expecting the, the array that has a pair of I and distance to have a class called, or sorry, a, an attribute called class, which it doesn't. So we're going to have to recall. Yeah, we're going to have to yeah, refer so to. In fact, let's let's run this code and see the error that, that happens. Um, which we're not going to get an actual not error. see, because I guess it can, it just neither of these happen, right? Uh, I'm asking for the class of of something that looks like this, um, which I guess it's just like that's undefined or something. Yeah, it will return a null. Yeah. Yeah. So in fact, I can just to demonstrate this. Let me log that. Grab my consoles. Yeah. So there's the mm. the undefined because I screwed this up. So. <laughs> We don't want to compare that. What we want to do is we want to say distances of j of 0. That's this variable. But this variable is just a number, right? That's That was the 0th element or the first element or whatever it was. So we can't ask for the class of a number. We want to ask for the point at that number. Mm -hmm looks really ugly. And so again, let me uh, let me log just this points of but, distances of j of 0. Yeah. <laughs> right, which is, so now we're logging the points. And the thing that we want to grab from the point is the class, which is either 1 or 0. So the, now this if statement should be working. And we got to make sure to do that for the second if statement. Good catch. I. Uh, <laughs> Definitely wasn't even thinking that. Cool. All right. What what next, Yuan? What's the what's the next point? So we've got um, we've now counted our, our neighbors, whether they're of class zero or class one. Um, what should we do with that now? Well, now we got to see which one wins, right? We got to see if class zero has a greater number than class class one. Yep. You, you and wanna again, put them there's in there's going to be an interesting, yeah, thank you. Uh, there's going to be an interesting tiebreaker here. Because um, if class zero is greater than class one, then something happens. Otherwise, something else is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Zero was red. So I'm going to say if class zero is greater than class one, I'm going to draw a red circle. Otherwise, I'm going to draw a green circle. And then finally, I want to actually, you know, color in my my background where my mouse is. So I want to draw an ellipse at mouse x, mouse y, and then let's make it 10 by 10, or maybe even smaller than that, 5 by 5. And OK, cool. So it's kind of working. Uh, uh, something is happening with the background where actually this might even be a better representation where I'm not constantly <laughs> drawing it over and over and over again. Um, cool. So yeah, I think I think that this is the part that's doing the classification is just setting the fill, which is a little bit. Uh, it feels a little anticlimactic, right? We do like all of this work. We like we compare all of the distances. We sort our list. We then count up the neighbors and. All we do at the end of the day is choose what color to draw our mouse. But again, that's kind of the point of all of this, where um, we want to classify our mouse point. Um, all right, Jiwon, what's the implication of the tie here with um, what if there are uh, four, if I look at my four nearest neighbors, and two are green and two are red? The way that we've coded it right now, who wins? The way that we've coded it, it's going to be green that will always win, right? Because yeah, I, we I it, class zero has to be, has to be greater than class one. So the only way that class zero will win is if it's three. If there are three uh, neighbors that are red, um, but if it's two, then it's going to think that it's going to be green. Right. And if I if we change this, if I said, if class zero is greater than or equal to class one, now if it's two, two, 
then we then we're classifying our mouse pointer as um, red rather than green. But I say there's like a really interesting opportunity to do um, a interesting visualization here for me in my perspective because yeah. you know for me I care a little less about the exactness of this um, science and I'm like oh this is going to be an interesting place where we could do if class zero is greater than um, class one then we could have it red if it's um, less than class one then we could have it green but if it's equal to each other then we could have it colored a mix of green and red right cool yeah, um, class one is greater than class zero. And then else, meaning they're equal, then we could fill uh, 255, 255, zero. And so let's see. Again, we're going to have to make sure that we're comparing an even number of neighbors just so we get the opportunity for them to be tied. Um, and then let's see if we can find a. Uh, <laughs> All right, can we eyeball a tie? Uh, let's see. Think like here. Oh, yeah. there we go. It's yellow. Um, I think if we take the take the background off, it would be easier to see. Yeah, and in fact, let draw. me uh, let me make the my mouse pointer uh, slightly bigger, just because it is hard to see. And then. What is white? Is it uh, 255, 255? But we might want to move that to setup so that we can just draw on top of it. Sure. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, so I'm just going to draw the background at the start. So now as I mouse over, it'll look like I'm. Uh, yeah, the, the yellow is interesting uh, in in most in most machine learning algorithms, you're not going to want a tie because it's uh, you don't know what to do with that. So again, there's like lots of different strategies on how to break the tie. Um, you, or, I mean, one of the most simple ones is just randomly picking one of the classes. Um, and that way you can get like a definitive answer because um, yeah, sometimes you don't, you don't really know what to do with, uh, with a tie. Um, right. Which is why I'm saying that if you were going, if you were using this algorithm for straight up machine learning algorithm, you wouldn't want to do that. But I'm like putting in a bit of like a twist from my perspective where I only care about creating, you know, beautiful looking things. For people. Yeah. yeah, then I think this is like a great opportunity to allow for that tie um, and create. Um, to me, it kind of is this, this sort of algorithm, the way that I see it. Um, we could create like a really interesting gradient visualization. Mm. So if we were to actually, you know, remove that display and draw um, so that we don't actually draw the points and then you could just oh. have, you know, users just play around with the mouse, but they don't really know um, what kind of uh, color that they're going to get. But this is like um, basically like a pain tool that you don't know what area is going to be colored in what, but it's totally decided um yeah based on the king years algorithm that's super clever where now i just have a uh a blank slate but there are those points in the background that um that are determining the color mm -hmm. interesting like it's so hard to get red i know and now uh, it's like it's hard to debug now that we don't see it but <laughs> here if we run it again i'm sure we will uh the, yeah, because mm -hmm. the thing is that, remember, we're randomizing the class of every point when we hit the run button. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible that um, we're just not getting a lot of red. Although two in a row now, I've, uh, there we go. Oh, there there's we go. Red. So there's probably a cluster of red points, you mm -hmm. know, right in this area. Yeah. Um, cool. Any other ideas that you have to, to make this kind of visually interesting, Jiwon? Um, the other thing I think would be really cool is if we had like, you know, obviously having more than one class is going to be interesting, but if we were to also not just use um, the mouse, but we could also randomly select different things so we could have like scattered almost like, um, you know, like paint falling on the paper, but then the, <laughs> the color of the paint depends on where it falls on the paint, a paper. So we could, um, instead of using mouse, but then I don't know if it's going to be something that could be easily doable. Um, sure, let's, I, I think we can do it. So yeah, I think we could put a random instead of mouse X and mouse Y. 
Yep, exactly. So let's do classify, we'll, we'll keep calling it classify mouse, but we'll say X and Y. So this now takes three points and we want the distance from X and Y mm. to the points in our array. And then do we use the mouse anywhere else? Yeah. And then we want to draw the the thing at x and y rather than our mouse. And then when we call it, um, let's do classify mouse. We can we can stick we can still use four neighbors, but we want random um, width and random height. And then let's even make these dots a little bit bigger just so it fills up quicker. And also, then no stroke. Like total, total overheating. <laughs> Good call. Yeah, no stroke would be nice. Uh, I probably could just put it at the top, but mm -hmm. um, Ooh. Nice. <laughs> and you can like obviously hone in on it. You can put it in like uh, so opacity and all the fills and you can put it like um, you know, you can even create a, a, another class on top of this so that basically the way that you draw it would be um, drawing an instance of a new class. So then um, you could decide on like the different shape of uh, different sizes for each of these drops as well, all that sorts of things. And um, you could do even further things like, um, I don't know, I think this, this is like a really interesting, like, like a pattern making almost. Yeah, it's cool. Oh my God, look at uh, <laughs> the outline. Here. <laughs> um, yeah, when I when I first made this, uh, I, so this the original thing is at the end of the. Um, oh my God, my computer is like totally overheating from uh, <laughs> from printing all of those arrays. But um, the original is at the very end of the K nearest neighbor course. Um, Let it load uh, again. This is the uh, I I put this solution code to this exact thing in the YouTube description. Um, it was just like captivating to like draw this out, and then it's like a Rorschach test of like, oh, what like what uh what image do you see you when uh, when you do K nearest neighbor here? Um, but you can see some of the other details that I added were I highlight which um which neighbors are the closest neighbors, mm -hmm. um, and then I also added some. Uh, some abilities for you to play with the inputs. So you can re-randomize the points, which just kind of like refreshes everything. Um, but then I can say, okay, this is what the space looks like with three neighbors. If I kick that up to five or six, the space is going to look, look slightly differently. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I'm also I'm, or like almost getting like an inspiration of creating like the abstract pointillism um, visualization. <laughs> By you know putting in more classes in there, so you could you could use you know a gradient of five five different colors and like create all these like pointillism pointillism things for like a bigger canvas with like smaller points. That's gonna make it a little you know the points a lot more finer. I think yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's a cool idea. Let me find um, man. Let me find another course that we have on Code Academy because it speaks to what you were talking about a little bit. Um, so. What we just did was classification, where the final output of our thing is your unclassified point is either um, zero or one, right? It's either red or green. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you can do with K nearest neighbor is, Jiwon, like you said, if you have kind of multiple classes, what you can do is you can um, run a regression on it where the output of that isn't just zero or one, it's some point along a spectrum. So, like between zero and five. Um, and again, it kind of really similar, um, really similar concept of you're comparing points, but then at the end of the day, you know, this point had a, had a value of zero, that point had a value of five, your third neighbor had a value of three, you know, you average those values together or you do something with those values together to get a final, uh, a final answer of like 2.5. Um, and another so, idea sorry. that I had. Um, was we could do a thing where, you know, similar to the one, one that we had before we used a mouse and if you click on it, it gets attract, you could um, code it with a little bit more physics in there and you could have that point attracted to one classification category versus another. Ooh. That could be really interesting. 
Um, kind of reminds me of the, like the pinball machine sort of aspect where you drop a ball in and it could it could go to one side versus the other based on which yeah, category. Like thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that could be also a really fun thing to create, try to create too. Um, if anyone wants to take up the challenge. Yeah, I would love to see if if folks uh, have been have watched through this whole thing and you're interested in it. I would love to see kind of what variations you can make of this. Um, yeah, what? it could be really, really cool if like anyone creates like a, you know, a remix of the P5.js sketch that we post as a web editor. If you want to like drop in your own web editor links as like comments in the video, that would be really cool to see. Yeah, that would be, that would be awesome. Um, so this is an example, again, using movie, mm -hmm. uh, movie stuff. Um, this is an example of regression where now we're not, it's not a binary thing of yes, I liked it or no, I didn't like it. This is something where um, I'm gonna go ahead and rate, uh, it, it, there has to be at least five because right now K is five. I'm gonna rate five movies. And now that those are in, all of the ones that I haven't rated um, are um, recommend, uh, recommended. And again, you have to think to yourself, okay, what are the features of these points that like, you can picture the you can picture the visual, visual visualization right as dots in some space and again I think let's see if we say it in here um, um, oh man I don't know if I uh, Man, yeah, I, I don't know what uh, what features um, we're actually running this on. I think it's like release year, length, and budget, or something like that. And that's that's how the points are being drawn in the space. And then we find our nearest neighbors. And so, as you you know, if I go ahead and uh, start rating old movies really low, you'll find that like the other old movies will also start to drop compared to the the recent movies or something something like that. Um, that's fun. Yeah. Like if I wanted to do like more than one gradient, I guess this is sort of like the algorithm that we'll take a look at to apply it behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. Um, couple more little like machine learning tidbits or things to uh, think about this for this algorithm is, right, one of the things that comes up with algorithms like this is the idea of a cold start problem where Again, this algorithm is kind of useless if I don't have a bunch of existing data. And so it's great that this exact algorithm exists behind the scenes, but in order for it to be useful, I have to actually start giving it some of my own data, right? I have to start rating movies myself. Mm. Um, so that's the, an example of the cold start problem of it takes some time for this algorithm to actually be useful because you need to give it- um, Some base points. It, yeah, some, some starting point. Um, and then the, the final thing that I want to say about this algorithm is that this is an example of a lazy algorithm, which means, um, let me actually go to um, the final version. Um, so this is a lazy algorithm because it doesn't do any work until you show up with a new point. So mm. the moment I show up with an unclassified point, it has to do all of the work right then, right? The, po the points are just sitting in space. I show up with a new point and it compares, uh, it compares that point to every point in the space. And so you could, you could imagine if there's, you know, a hundred thousand points in the space, that's a lot of work that it has to do. It has to make a hundred thousand comparisons. Um, that's in contrast to, I think it's called, eager learner learning algorithms where these other algorithms they kind of do the pre-processing ahead of time where they have a sense of the decision space they have a sense of where things are going to turn green versus where things are going to turn blue and in those algorithms you show up with a new point and it doesn't have to do all the math then it just says hey you fell in this space and I, earlier i calculated that that space should be green mm. um, versus this lazy approach, which it doesn't know anything about the space. It just knows it knows where the points are. And when a new point shows up, it has to do all of the math. Um, yeah, so uh, kind of two different styles of, of algorithms. Almost makes me um, think that we could do the eager version as a grid, 
and then we could have all the points in each of the grid cells calculated and if the mouse is over then it changes the color of the grid too that could be fun too yeah that's kind of um that, yeah that's kind of how some of those algorithms work where um yeah it's like yeah, you can visualize it as already the thing that you see is already kind of like the filmed in version of this picture where you already see like the mm. boundaries. And so then mm. when a point lands, it just kind of classifies it as one or the other. Cool. It's super interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love uh, I love P5 because you're able to, like this is a complicated algorithm, right? I, I didn't learn this until like well into college. And so being able to like super quickly, right? We did that in under an hour of being able to visualize it and kind of get a, a good conceptual understanding of what, what the algorithm does. I think it's, I, I love P5 for it because it, <laughs> it just makes stuff like that so fun. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. G1, do you want to plug what we're doing next week? Yeah, next week is going to be our final live stream series for um, Creative Coding with Code Academy. And what we're going to do next week is I'm, I'm personally really, really a huge fan of, you know, these things, but we're going to be basically creating a visualization that's driven by audio. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, learn how to import in a audio file inside of our P5.js sketch. We're going to learn how to play it. We're going to also um, learn how to, to analyze the uh, music data itself um, program, pro, in term, using programming. And we're going to use specifically what's called an FST or fast Fourier transform algorithm. It sounds really complicated, but the <laughs> thing with P5.js is that you, you don't have to know too much about it. There's already a class built in for you. There's already a function built in for you. And so we're going to use that and make things move based on the frequency and the beats in a music. So that's going to be hopefully really interesting thing for a lot of people. And so it's kind of also like a, a boom at the end being like, <laughs> like a really interesting thing that you can create using music and also visualization. So we're going to be doing that, that next great. week. And yeah, and you're doing that with Nick, right? Yeah. Nice. Cool. cool. All right. Well, I think that is all for us for today. So uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for watching and we'll, we'll see you next week.